Good morning, everyone. It's great to see you all here in God's house this morning. If you're visiting with us, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, Hopefully you received one of these service cards on your way in. On the bottom is a connection card that tears off. And if you could please fill out any information you feel comfortable sharing, we'd love to connect with you um, and get in contact with you so that we can serve you better. Here at Peace, something that's emphasized in all of our worship services and something we really value is that Lutheran principle of sola scriptura, by scripture alone. And so throughout our worship service this morning, you'll see that emphasis. You'll see that in the responses that we speak with one another. You'll see that in our songs and especially in our sermon Uh, Pastor Jonathan will give us a really deep look at what God has to say to us in Ecclesiastes chapter 3. A lot going on this Sunday. Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the church calendar. We've been in that season of end times, and now we're at the end of end times. So this morning, our scriptural theme will be Christ as our King and everything that he does for us. This morning, we'll also have the opportunity to see a little baby enter God's kingdom at his baptism. Let's begin with our opening song, Before the Throne of God Above. You're welcome to sing along. In these opening responses, the words of sin and grace, we confess our sins to God and we acknowledge that we have been sinful from birth. 
But we also trust God's grace. We trust his promise that our sins have been washed away. Please stand. We begin with the words spoken to you at your baptism. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. Surely we were sinful at birth, sinful from the time our mothers conceived us. We find that reality at work in our inner beings all the days of our lives. That's why we can confess that our personal experience is the same as the Apostle Paul's. I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Like the rest, I am by nature deserving of wrath, but I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Christ loved you and gave himself up for you, the church, to make you holy, cleansing you by the washing with water through the word and presenting you to himself as a radiant church, without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You may be seated. The words of this next song beautifully portray the promises of baptism. Blessings that God has showered upon us and blessings that he is showering upon Ezra. You're welcome to sing along.
Ezra is being brought to baptism in obedience to Jesus' command. He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. He also specifically commanded that we bring him children when he said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Ezra is being brought, trusting God, Christ's almighty word. The word, not the water and baptism, is what works. The Apostle Peter taught us the word and baptism is so powerful that baptism now saves you. He also taught that the power and promise of baptism are for young and old alike. On the day of Pentecost, he said, The promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. By water and the Spirit, Jesus promised we are born again and made children of God. Ezra received the sign of the cross on the head and on the heart to mark you as a redeemed child of God. We pray, Holy God, Mighty Lord, Gracious Father, in obedience to your command to baptize all nations and trusting your promise to give grace through it, we ask that you look with favor on Ezra. Through this water of baptism, drown in him all sin inherited from Adam and any evil he may do. Set him apart from the unbelieving world and hold him safe and secure in the holy ark of the church. Keep him always fervent in spirit and joyful in hope that he may honor your holy name, and at last receive, together with all your people, the promised inheritance of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Ezra John Schultz, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Ezra, God saved you through this washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit, so that having been justified by His grace, you might become an heir, having the hope of eternal life. You are Jesus' little lamb. Come here, little man. All right. He's going to let the world know. Yeah. Look at this church. I hope this is a beautiful reminder for all of you who have been baptized that your sins are washed away. And also that we have a responsibility to each other and to Ezra to raise him up in the Lord and continue to teach him his holy word. Did you notice that prayer? He has been brought into the holy ark of the church where we care for each other in love. I'm going to bring this little man back to mom before we totally lose it. Happy baptism day. You ready, Mom? There we go. Dear Kyla, sponsors, and church family, our Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ in commanding baptism not only commanded that children should be baptized, but also that they be taught to obey everything he commanded us. I therefore ask you, do you sincerely intend to bring up Ezra in the way of the Lord and to instruct him in the truths of God's saving word so that he may grow in faith, serve God with a Christian life, and continue to hold to the promise given him through baptism until the end? If so, answer, yes, and we ask God to help us. We pray, merciful Father in heaven, we pray for this church today, 
Help every baptized soul here to see the grace that has been poured out on them in their baptism. Help us to regard it as the robe of Christ's righteousness we wear every day of our lives. Give us the strength to carry out all our responsibilities to all the baptized, so that all of us may finally come to the blessed joys of heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And we join together in singing, O gracious Lord, with love draw near. Please stand for the prayer of the day. Lord Jesus Christ, by your victory you have broken the power of the evil one. Fill our hearts with joy and peace as we look with hope to that day when every creature in heaven and earth will acclaim you King of kings and Lord of lords to your unending praise and glory. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. We just heard it in the prayer, Christ is King of kings and Lord of lords, and he has also made us to be his kingdom. We read from Revelation chapter 1. 
Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory and power forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all peoples on earth will mourn because of him. So shall it be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is God's word. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. On Good Friday, hours before his death, Pontius Pilate asks Jesus about his kingship. We read from John chapter 18. Pilate then went back inside the palace, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your own idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied, Your own people and chief priests handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest by the Jewish leaders. But now my kingdom is from another place. You are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. In fact, the reason I was born and came into the world is to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. This is the gospel of our Lord. You may be seated for our hymn of the day, Crown Him with Many Crowns. Our scripture for today comes from Ecclesiastes chapter 3, 
And we're going to crown this church year off. We're looking forward to Advent next week. Here's what Solomon, the great wise man, says to us. There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to uproot. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to tear down and a time to build. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to scatter stones and a time to gather them. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up. A time to keep and a time to throw away. A time to tear and a time to to mend. A time to be silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time for war and a time for peace. What do workers gain from their toil? I have seen the burden God has laid on the human race. He has made everything beautiful in its time. He also, he has also set eternity in the human heart. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to end. I know that there is nothing better for people than to be happy and to do good while they live. That each of them may eat and drink and find satisfaction in all their toil. This is the gift of God. I know that everything God does will endure forever. Nothing can be added to it and nothing taken from it. God does it so that people will fear him. Whatever is, has already been. And what will be, has been before. And God will call the past to account. This is God's word. I don't know if you know this, but uh, Solomon, he holds quite the distinction. He sits in the company of Adele, Justin Bieber, and The Weeknd. Pretty exclusive company. Adele's in there very recently for a song that just came out called Easy On Me. Justin Bieber for a song called Stay, and The Weeknd for a song called Blinding Lights. What is it? They all landed in the Billboard Top Hot 100 Hits. It happened like this. Solomon's poem got ripped wholesale out of the Bible. Singer, folk singer by the name of Peter Seeger took it, added seven little words to it, just seven, and made a song. Then another group called the Birds took Seeger's lyrics, reset it to a new tune, and it went straight to the top. Solomon holds the distinction of being the oldest writer to ever make it into the top 100 of the billboard. He's quite the writer of lyrics. Peter Seeger, I'm not quite so sure. He thought pretty highly of himself. He actually took royalties for the lyrics that he had written, even though he only wrote seven of the words. And six of them I'm not quite so sure about. If you listen to the song, he tags on one little line. The line goes like this. Right after the word peace in the poem, he writes, I swear it's not too late. When he does this, he effectively does two things. The first thing he does is he takes Solomon's poem and he turns it into a war protest. Some of you might remember that the song came out around the time of the Vietnam War. 
he takes the song, he turns it into a war protest, and that's the second thing that he does, is he distorts the meaning of the poem. The poem is nothing of the sort. The poem actually claims a time for both war and peace, so I'm not so quite so sure about six of his words. But I am certain about the seventh. He added the word turn. If he distorts the meaning of the poem with his first six words, he gets it exactly right with the seventh. Turn. That's what time does. It turns. Turn. That's what seasons do. They turn. Everything in life, it turns. War and peace and healing and, and killing and, and laughing and mourning. It turns. It turns. This, that, it turns life. It always turns. Peter Seeger says, turn, turn, turn. I want to take you through Solomon's counsel about what to do about this turning. And I want to try to hang it on Peter Seeger's words, turn. Solomon tells you to do three things about the way that things always turn. First, you turn down. Second, you turn in. Third, you turn up. The first thing that Solomon tells you to do is turn down. We're not talking about something that you do with your bed. What we're talking about is your own sense of agency. The sense of control that you have in your life. The very first thing that Solomon gives you after he gives you the poem is he gives you a question. He asks this question, what can the lay worker do with all of his labor? What can you change when it comes to all the seasons and the times of life? What can you do? Not much. What are you going to do about the time you were born? Climb back, climb back inside your mama? What are you going to do? What are you going to do if you don't like it that it's fall right now? Skip ahead to the spring? What are you going to do? Times and seasons, they happen to you. Whether you like it or not. That's the way that life is. It happens to you. Most of it. Whether you like it or not. If you're not there yet, look at the poem. It'll get you there. I stand here with a biblical commentator, a guy by the name of Walter Kaiser, who says that while this happens to be one of the most famous poems in the Bible, it's also one of the least well understood. It's different than the poem Psalm 23 in that way. People know that. It's one of the most famous poems in the Bible. They also understand it. This one, not quite so much. This poem is not advice for your life. It is a proclamation. Life is not what you make it out to be. Life is not what you choose it to be. Life is not chance and life is not fate. Life is according to God's plan. Look at the poem. It starts with your birth and with your death. You didn't choose it. You don't get to. The dates that are going to end up on your tombstones, you don't get to pick it. It's unchosen. It happens to you. There's a time for it. Your life from beginning to end is in God's hands. The rest of it is too. The rest of the poem, it takes in all the rest of life. You enter it and all of a sudden, 
Solomon says you don't get to pick whether you're in a time of healing or whether you're in a time of killing. You don't. You don't get to pick your relationships either. Not really. People are born at the same time you are. You bump into them. Some of them are having a good day and some of them are having a bad day and you just experience most of it. This is how it is. All your emotions are the same way. Stuff happens to you. You don't get to pick whether you go to a funeral. You don't get to pick whether you go to the hospital. You cry or you laugh. You mourn or your joy, it happens to you. Solomon says that goes for the big stuff in life. It also, happens, goes, it also happens to you in the little stuff in life. That's exactly what Solomon says. Some of you think that you picked what's in your kitchen. You didn't. I watch HTV too. There's a time for gathering certain kinds of stones, and then there's a kind for throwing some away. Some away. You know how it works. Granite is in. And then all of a sudden, it's marble. Ten years later, you build your perfect kitchen. It's just the way you want it. You walk in 15 years later, and you say, this is the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. You think you picked your kitchen. You didn't. The times did. You think you, pay, you picked those high-waisted pants. You didn't. That happened to you. There's a time for mending and there's a time to tear it up. You know how it works, even with the fashions. Your life from beginning to end. It happens to you. You do not pick when you live. You do not pick when you die. You don't pick your relationships. You don't pick whether it's a time of healing. You don't even pick the granite in your kitchen. Life happens to you. So what we do about that is we turn down our sense of agency. But we don't turn it off. We turn it down. We don't turn it off. There's wisdom here from Solomon. What we do when we realize most of life is above it is we realize we don't get to pick the seasons that we live in. But what we can do is live in those seasons. So you may not plant corn in the fall. But you will in the spring. This is how life works. You live inside the seasons in which God places you. Sometimes that means you don't wear a mustache. Because you know what everybody thinks about that these days. Other times it means you're like a shepherd. You understand that when it comes to one sheep, that the time is there when you want to mend it and you heal it. But then later down the line with the same sheep, you realize there's also a time to slit its throat. And both are acts of mercy. There is a time to heal and a time to kill. The same man can go off to war and he uses his hands to pull a trigger and then he comes home on the GI Bill and he uses it to become a doctor and he uses the same hands to heal people. Same man. Different seasons. Contradictory actions. Both correct. You live in the seasons in which you have been placed when it comes to the things that are beyond your control. But there are some things that are under your control. And Solomon gives that to you too. We can't control much, but we can control this. How we respond and what we do. That's what Solomon says. We can't control much. Most of life, it just happens to you, but we can't control this. What's, what's under control is enjoying our lives and doing good. That we can do. We can't control as a church that we live in a time of massive cultural change. But you know what we can do? Enjoy 
being a stronghold amidst it. We can't control the the fact that we do not live in a time of union. We actually live in a time of fracturing and hostility and even hatred. Can't control it. But what we can do is we can love and give truth to every person that we meet. The theologian Reinhold Niebuhr summed this up in a very famous prayer. He asked God to help him accept the things that he cannot control. To change, to have the courage to change the things that he can. And to have the wisdom to know the difference. Turn your agency down, way down. But not off. And then turn in. Niebuhr, in his prayer, said we need to accept the things that we can't change. That's the hard part. Solomon named it before he did. Solomon, in reflecting on God's plan, said that it's a burden on us. He said, the burden works like this. God has placed inside of every human being eternity. We have eternity in our hearts. Yet, here's the problem. Nobody, nobody can grasp what God has done from beginning to end. That's the burden. We have this longing. God has placed it into us, this this ache that we understand how everything in, that is going on out there fits like a, like a jigsaw puzzle under God to create this perfect picture. We long to see the picture, but we can't. And it aches us. Especially because we understand so much. We look at God's creation and we see how beautiful it is. We agree with Solomon. Solomon says that God has made everything beautiful in its time. The sunset and that perfect autumn tree that that flashed by in the corner of your eye on the way to church. Everything, God has made it beautiful in his time. We see that. We even understand the creation on some sort of academic level, right? We, we have the hard sciences of, of physics and we've, we're grasping some of these things. We've got the periodic table. We do experiments. We start to grasp the creation on some kind of academic level. We even grasp it on some kind of theological level that God has a destiny for the world and that it is, in fact, all summed up in Christ. We understand that. But still... We want to see the whole picture. We are left with this ache, this unquenchable thirst. We want to understand how our lives fit like a perfect, beautiful piece in the puzzle that is God's plan. But we can't. There's a morning this past summer when I experienced that enigma myself. We went over to see some family over on Lake Murray, moved down from D.C. And so it was our first summer visiting them on the lake. We went on a Friday night. If you've never had a chance to do it, you got to do it. There's this amazing island called Bomb Island in Lake Murray. Bomb Island is very famous for the purple martins that come and roost on the island in the summer. Over a million birds. They all take off at the same time at dawn. So we get in the boat, we go out to Bomb Island. The sun is just about to rise. All of a sudden we hear 
the whirring of hundreds of thousands of wings. I'm telling you, I thought that I was living in planet Earth. It was so miraculous. It was one of the most incredible experiences of my life to see life and life and more life, God's glorious majesty of life everywhere around me. And then the enigma hit. I was the only guy in the boat to get bird bombed. <laughs> they, it wasn't an enigma to everybody else. They said it was because I had the head that was easiest to clean. <laughs> I didn't agree. So we go back to the house. Our hearts are still stirring with the glory of it. I got my little puppy, little four or five pound dog. I put her on the ground. You know how they are. The little ones, they all think they're bigger than they are. She starts playing too hard. All of a sudden, I hear a scream. Not a yelp, a scream. I know what it is. I'm not a vet, but I knew. I took one look at her leg, and it was busted completely in half. Nobody's fault. It just happened. I scoop her up. I put her in my arm. I say, Melanie, we got to go to the animal hospital. This thing is broken. We get in the car. Her little body's quaking in the crook of my arm. And then it hits me, my second enigma. I say to my wife, why? Why? How is this a part of the plan? But see, I don't really care that much about dogs. I wanted you to think about your pains. Why? Why? That's the burden. That's the burden. Can you turn in and see that? See, the burden is that God only knows. God only knows. We don't know. God only knows. That's the burden. I heard a story, it was in the national news. I don't know why. It happens a lot. Anyway, the story goes like this. Lady gets cancer, she's dying. Nice next door neighbor comes over. Pleasant lady, no doubt. Was bringing food, just trying to care. She goes up. They start talking. She says to the husband, there's a reason for everything, she says. And the husband answers, yeah, and what is it? That's the enigma. God only knows. Turn in and see that. Because when you do, that's when you'll look up. That's when you'll look up. See, Solomon says that God places this burden on us for a reason. And the reason is so that we'll look up. He says that God does it so that we'll fear Him. So that we'll trust Him. So that we will look up. In fact, that's, that's the whole point of this poem, of this entire section. I say this, and I'm not alone in saying it, that Ecclesiastes chapter 3, in a very real way, is the Romans chapter 8 of the entire Old Testament. It's, it's the chapter in the Old Testament that says God has a plan. God is 
king. God is sovereign. Nobody can stop God from doing what God is doing. God has a plan. He's got, get this, a beautiful one. That's what Solomon says. Not me. He says it's a beautiful plan. You can sense it in the poetry. That's why we love the poem. It's a beautiful plan. God has a beautiful plan. But the, but, the, but the thing is, we can't see it. So what we have to do is trust it. That God not only has a right plan. It is right, by the way. God is right. He's righteous. Therefore, everything that he does is righteous. Everything that God does is right. It is good. It's also beautiful, Solomon says. Solomon says that it's aesthetically pleasing, like a a sunrise, like, like great friendships or a good drink or deep love. It's not just right. It's beautiful. But you don't get to see it, not yet. All you can do is trust it. It's right for us to think about this on Christ the King Sunday, don't you think? This is a Sunday when we sum it all up. We're summing up this sermon series. We are, we are summing up this church here and we're doing it all in Christ. It is right. What God does is right. We know that in Christ. God has done the righteous thing of saving unrighteous people. He has made us right in the blood of the Lamb. God's plan is right. It's all so beautiful. Christ has promised us a new beautiful life in His resurrection from the dead. God is doing something right now that is so much more than right. It is beautiful. You can't see it. You can trust it. So please do. Please do. I want to put this in the negative first. You know what this means? Stop yearning for a different life. Stop it. Do you know why you sometimes yearn for a different life? Because you don't know your own life well enough. That's the tension, right? God has a beautiful plan. You're a part of it, but you can't see it right now. All you can do is trust it. Stop yearning for a different life. Not a life that's more exciting or more boring, richer or poorer, quieter or louder, somewhere else or with someone else or something like that. Stop yearning for a different life and instead embrace the life you have. Your life is not a mistake. It is not only right, it is righteous in Christ. But now here's the positive side of it. Trust more powerfully than ever before that God is going to make something beautiful with it. Nobody can stop God. Nobody can add to what he has done and nobody can subtract from it. See, I told you before that what this poetry does is it, is it lowers your sense of agency, but you know what else? When you know what it does to everybody else? The same thing. Seasons happen to everybody. Times happen to everybody except God. Nobody can add to what God has done and nobody can subtract from it. 
That's true for your own life. I want you to know today that I agree with Solomon. I agree with him. And I am not a man in denial. It wasn't all that long ago when I was sitting in an animal hospital watching animal after animal after animal coming in and I wasn't thinking about the animals. You know what I was thinking? I was thinking about children's hospitals. Ones that I've been in with my own daughter before. I'm not a man in denial. But I am a man of faith. God does not do ugly. He makes beautiful. Think of that in your own life. Go all Ecclesiastes 3 and Romans 8 on it. There is not a time in your life that is outside of God's hands. Not your life and not your death. There is not a season where you can be ripped away from what God is doing so beautifully in your life. Not the present and not the future. There is not an actor or any kind of agency in all of creation that can take you away from Christ. Not an angel and certainly not a demon. Turn, turn, turn. Everything changes. Except one thing. Except for the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. I thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for these inspired words from your great, 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 great grandfather, Solomon. We thank you for the wisdom that he shared with us. We ask, Lord, humbly that it would turn us down in our agency, but not off. That it would turn us in so that we might turn up in faith towards you, our God, who in Christ makes everything beautiful forever. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Please stand. And let's confess our faith this morning using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures, He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. At this time, the offering plates will come around. Um, Please do share your connection cards with us um, when they do.
At this time in the worship service, we have the opportunity as a kingdom and priest to serve God and to approach our King with confidence. Please stand for the prayer of the church. As we wait patiently for the Lord's return, let us pray to our gracious God on behalf of the whole church and for all people according to their needs. Most merciful God and Father, give your holy church throughout the world your grace to serve you with reverence and awe, granting us faith to endure to the end. Lord, in your mercy, open the mouths of the pastors in our church body and give them the words to testify to your love in Christ Jesus and the hope that is in them. Lord, in your mercy, Heavenly Father, you know all our anxieties and fears. Grant to those troubled in mind and spirit the strength to cast every care on you. According to your will, give them quietness of heart and a firm trust in the mercy you have shown us in Christ Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, place the lonely in the family of your holy church, O Lord, that they may find peace in Christ and fulfillment and loving service to their neighbor. Lord, in your mercy, make the leaders of our nation to walk in the way of justice and truth, that they may use the power vested in them to protect the weak and innocent. Lord, in your mercy, in the face of natural disasters, wars, famines, and troubles of all kinds, Fill our hearts with repentance and humility, that in every circumstance we may trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, look with favor on all who are in need. Fill the hungry with good things. Give the poor and unemployed gainful employment. Heal the sick. Comfort those who mourn and watch over all who travel. Be near the dying. Give courage to those who suffer oppression and want. Defend orphans and widows, and protect the weak, the unborn, and the aged. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we join together in the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please stay standing for our closing song.
You may be seated. Good morning again, and welcome to Peace. It was great having you here. Uh, guests, if you could put, put those connection cards in the bins as you're walking out, that would be much appreciated. Uh, I just want to thank you as a church for, for welcoming Ezra into your family. Um, I also want to just thank my brother Caleb and his wife Brandy for being godparents, and also Kyla's sister Annika and her husband Sam, who are godparents from afar. So I just want to thank you for that. We know that Ezra is in, is in great hands. He's in God's hands. A couple announcements for this morning. Christmas decorating will take place right after worship, so please stick around to offer any assistance. That'd be great. Uh, Michelle Sullivan is leading this. Please gather here in the sanctuary in a few minutes after announcements are done, and she'll give directions for decorating. This week, there will not be supper and study. Enjoy the time uh, for Thanksgiving. There are a couple additional announcements, and I'm going to hand it off to Melanie and Andrew to make those for us. Good morning. Um, Michelle did say that, Michelle's over here, um, if you're going to stay and help decorate, she's asking that you would meet her in the hallway or in the classroom. Over by all the decorations, they're in Vicar's office right now, that classroom across from the kitchen. Um, I have an announcement about the Cumbie Center Service Project. Uh, the Cumbie Center here in Aiken um, is a really important organization. It supports and empowers victims of domestic and sexual abuse. They offer a number of service and supports for victims and their families, including offering safe sleeping accommodations for those who are fleeing abusive situations. I believe this is our fourth or fifth year partnering um, with the Cumbie Center at Christmas time to provide Christmas gifts for the families that they serve. We have been provided with wish lists for five families at this time. It may increase um, as we get closer. But we have a list online through Sign Up Genius, which you can access on, um, from our weekly email, or you can let me know that you need a link to that if you don't have it. And that'll show you where you can claim items to donate. We do need people to specifically claim which items they're going to donate so that we can provide a good variety for each of the families. Um, there's also a list up on the table in the Welcome Center where you can see all those items and then you can go up to Sign Up Genius and sign up. If you're not comfortable using Sign Up Genius, just let me know which items you plan to donate and then I'll mark it down for you. Um, the donations must be newly purchased and brought to church unwrapped by Sunday, December 12th. So we have a few weeks and we'll have the drop off in Vicar's office. If you prefer to donate money toward the purchase of these wish list items, that's great. We actually have a few items that are a little more challenging to purchase, so we'd appreciate monetary do donations as well. If you are going to donate money, we'll accept cash or a check made out to peace. Just put it in an envelope marked for the Cumbie Center so that we can make sure that that's what that money gets used for. Or you can hand it to me or Kenneth or put it in the offering plate. We would like those donations as soon as possible so we have time to order the items we need to before that cutoff date. If you have any questions at all, I'll be in the Welcome Center at the table where you can get the little flyers with the list and I'll answer any questions you have. Kenneth Brody is also partnering with me on this and you can ask him questions too. One other announcement I have is about Night of a Thousand Lights. We've been talking about that for a few weeks. It's just 11 days away. It's a great um, opportunity for us to invite people to Christmas here at Peace. We're hoping to hand out over 200 invitations again this year, but we need your help for that. There's a lot of different jobs. One of the jobs is just being friendly and smiling and talking to people when they're here, but there are other tasks too. If you're willing at all to help in any capacity, please sign up at that table in the Welcome Center. I'll be standing there. It's the same table. And um, I'll get in touch with you, and we can get you hooked up with exactly the job that you're comfortable with doing that night. As many of you as possible, I'd really appreciate your help on that. Um, we also need cookie donations for that event. We um, offer free cookies and cocoa to people as they pass through. So if you're willing to donate either store-bought or homemade cookies, you can sign up at the table as well. One more thing I have... Um, with Ezra's baptism today, as you know, we often have that keepsake that we sign for um, the newly baptized child. It's in the Welcome Center on a, one of the high top tables. If you would just sign it, you can have a little greeting or blessing for them on there as well. And I'd really appreciate that. I know that the Schultzes would appreciate that as well. Andrew, there he is. Good morning, everybody. Um, 
so there's a group of us that have been working together uh, to put together a little feedback session on uh, the different ways that we grow together as a church in grace and, and knowledge um, and, and Bible knowledge. Um, so in peace, as y'all know, there's, there's a number of ways that we do that. And we just want to get some feedback on uh, just the effectiveness of what we're doing as a church to, to grow together. So next Sunday, for about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, we're going to get together and just have some group discussions on the main ways that we do grow together as, as a church um, and what we're doing right, what we can do to improve and get better, uh, changes you might want to see, or you know, just feedback on, on what we're doing really well and, and really helps us to, to um, strengthen our relationship with God. So um, our goal is just some candid conversations. Uh, we'll get to more of the, the logistical details next week when we get, get into it, but we just want some candid feedback on, on how we're doing and what we're doing. Um, so we will have somebody in a nursery in case there's families that want to um, be able to participate in those conversations and, and drop, some, drop kids off, uh, including myself. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, next Sunday, about 30, 45 minutes. Um, really would appreciate everybody sticking around uh, that is available to stick around and, and just have some, some good conversation on, on ways that we're, we're building each other up in, in Christ. So um, that's all I have on that. And Vicar, good. Pastor, good. All right, I think that's all we have. So everybody have a blessed, blessed week, and thank you.